Thanks for joining us today on Mormon Land, where we explore news in and about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm Managing Editor Dave Noyce. I oversee the Salt Lake Tribune's faith coverage. I'm joined again by Senior Religion Reporter Peggy Fletcher Stack. Hi, Peggy. Hi, Dave. We remind our listeners about another way to support Mormon Land. Just go to patreon.com, where with a donation as small as $3 a month, you can access transcripts to our podcast, our complete newsletter, and all of our exclusive religion coverage. Again, that's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Mormon Land. Now for today's show. The infamous and inexcusable Mountain Meadows Massacre lives on as the bloodiest stain on the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The 2008 book, Massacre at Mountain Meadows, offered modern readers the most complete look to date at the atrocity, when on September 11th, 1857, Mormon settlers deceived a wagon train of emigrants on their way to California through Southern Utah and then slaughtered about a hundred men, women, and children. Now comes the follow-up volume, titled Vengeance is Mine, The Mountain Meadows Massacre and Its Aftermath, examining how church leaders in southern Utah tried to cover up the crime, how investigations were thwarted, and how justice was delayed and denied. In the end, only one perpetrator, John D. Lee, was executed. They also explore a key Watergate-like question. What did church prophet President Brigham Young know, and when did he know it? The authors, Richard E. Turley and Barbara Jones Brown, join us today in studio to discuss their highly anticipated volume. Welcome to you both. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you so much. Okay, so just to kind of set the stage a little bit, what were the conditions like in Utah, including the relationship between Latter-day Saints and the federal government leading up to the attack? Uh, Rick, do you want to take that first? Sure. This atrocity was a wartime atrocity. In 1857 and 1858, the Utah Territorial Militia, known as the Nauvoo Legion, was at war with the federal government. James Buchanan, the president, had sent out troops, and the Latter-day Saints in Utah were worried about what those troops were going to do to them. And atrocities often occur in wartime or at other times when, when the circumstances are really unsettled. Also during this time, Brigham Young had launched what he called a reformation. He felt his people were spiritually declining and he wanted to bring them back to a pretty great spirituality. And associated with that, there was a lot of very strong rhetoric referred to by one speaker as raining pitchforks with the tines downward. Mm -hmm. Name of one of your chapters, I believe. <laughs> yes. <That's right. laughs> so, anything more to bring to that, Barbara? Yeah, so the, there was just this uh, this uh, war hysteria, this this culture of fear going on at the time, and and that violent rhetoric and and teachings by some um, church leaders at the time. They certainly never intended for the massacre to happen, but the listeners of this rhetoric interpreted it in their own way, and tragically, ultimately, it led to this horrific massacre of innocent people. Yeah. We we want to get to the aftermath, of course, which is what the, the the book is about. But tell our listeners how the actual massacre took place, what happened, which I think you say took six minutes. So, Rick? On the day of the final massacre, September 11th, 1857, John D. Lee, representing the territory militia, went into the wagon fort that had been built by the besieged immigrants. He promised them safe passage to the settlements, particularly Cedar City. And then he had them come out in a particular order. He told them that they were being assaulted by local Indians, Paiutes, and that if they came forward with the women and children first, they would be safe because the Paiutes were angry at the men because the men had shot and killed and, and injured some of them. So they brought the women and children out first, beginning with two wagons that had the smallest children and the injured in it, then the women. And then after that, the men came out single file, guarded each by one of these territorial militiamen. At a given signal, the militiamen turned to the men, shot them at close to point blank range, and then the slaughter of the women and children occurred. And I think we should also point out that the, the, though that final slaughter was uh, said by one of the perpetrators, Nephi Johnson, to have taken six minutes, the actual siege uh, went on for five days. So the initial attack uh, occurred on September 7th, and then the final slaughter, as Rick mentioned, occurred on September 11th. Mm -hmm. And even though the people who planned and led the massacre were white Southern Utah settlers, they had planned from the beginning to blame all of this on the Southern Paiutes who have suffered from that blame to this day. Mm. Um, okay. So Brigham Young, 
Many people, uh, including some historians, believe Brigham Young ordered the massacre. What did your research prove? What did you discover in your research about Brigham's role in it? So we looked at that. We looked very carefully tracing what Brigham Young knew and when he knew it. Um, so before the massacre takes place, Isaac Haight, who is the Cedar City state president and also the militia ma major in Cedar City, sends a letter to Brigham Young saying something to the effect of there are some emigrants here corralled. We've been having some issues with them. Unfortunately, that letter to Young did not survive, so we don't know exactly what it said, but it said something to the effect that there were some emigrants that were corralled near Cedar City and Isaac Haight was asking what they should do about it. That he sends it with an express writer named James Haslam to Salt Lake City. That letter arrives on September 10th, 1857. Brigham Young uh, and his advisor, Daniel H. Wells, craft a letter to send back to Haight. We have a record of that in a letterpress copy book. So we know that that response was written on September 10th. And in that response, Brigham Young said, if those who are there will go in peace, let them go. Unfortunately, that express rider did not arrive in Cedar City until September 13th after the massacre had occurred. So that's the first thing that Brigham Young knows is that there's something going on down there. The next thing he hears about is on September 29th, 1857, when John D. Lee comes to Salt Lake City to report the crime. He lies about it. That's a fascinating part, Barbara, because <laughs> yeah. I he think he... It sounds like he expected a different reaction from Brigham Young at one point and then starts changing yeah, the story. Is, this is where the victim blaming begins. He's saying yeah. terrible things about the emigrants. He's saying that they were part of the mob in Missouri and Illinois. He's saying that they said Joseph Smith should have been killed a lot sooner than he was. He says that they were poisoning springs, which led to the death of some Indians and a Mormon boy near Fillmore. Um and he's expecting Brigham Young to maybe say, yeah, these people deserve to die. But Young is sickened by it. And he interrupts Lee and says, stop, I can't stand to hear anymore. And emigration must stop. So from the beginning, after the local leaders in Cedar City and Southern Utah received this note from Young saying, let them go. Then they start covering up to church leaders as well. And it takes years and Rick can talk more about that as well. But it takes years before Brigham Young comes to believe and accept the full story of what happened when one of his own men named Nephi Johnson tells him the truth about what actually happened. So if they didn't get orders, they didn't get anything from Brigham Young, how'd they decide to do this? As we've sometimes said before, the entire massacre was a cover up. What happens initially is there is a conflict, a minor conflict in Cedar City. The people in Cedar City know that Brigham Young's wartime policy is to preserve cattle and grain in case they're under siege by the federal army. So we know that Isaac Haight, even before the emigrants reached Cedar City, said, let's try to get some cattle out of these people. When they reach Cedar City, they have managed to find some grain in spite of, in spite of an embargo on grain sales, and they take it to the mill and ask for it to be ground. And the miller says, yes, that'll be one beef, which was a very, very high price. Now, we all know that trading posts charged whatever they could get for things across the plains, but this felt particularly like gouging to them because they had come across the plains. When Alexander Fancher had first arrived in Utah in 1851, he had met a friendly reception. They expected reprovision going down through the settlements. They couldn't reprovision. So they were, they were kind of irritated by how the Latter-day Saints had treated them. They also had some other minor conflicts like that. Ultimately, they took their complaint to Isaac Haight. Isaac Haight saw writers coming up to his door, interpreted them as mobbers, sent out the local Marshal John Higby to arrest them. He wasn't able to arrest them because like most immigrants crossing the plains, they weren't about to leave one of their people with a local. And so they just said, I'm, I'm, we're just going to hurry on down the trail and you don't worry about us. So they left thinking everything was okay. Haight's thinking we need some cattle. Plus, I think he's felt a little bit that his pride is injured. So he writes to Parowan to his military leader. William Damon says, we want to do something. Dame looks at the circumstances, writes back and says, words are but wind, just let them go. Hate feeling like his leader isn't understanding him, thinks, okay, if I can't do this officially, I'm going to do it unofficially. He calls John D. Lee, a man he knew was very strong from Harmony, and asks him to gather up some people and attack the company 
Now, initially, they were just going to circle them and find them cattle. But by the time they get to Mountain Meadows, the, the, this is accelerated a bit, and they're supposed to attack them, not at Mountain Meadows, but when they go down into the Valley of the Santa Clara, where it'll be easy to shoot from the cliffs. Lee and the people he's with decide why wait, and they attack early. In the meantime, Haight has taken all of this to his council in Cedar City on a Sunday. Council members don't back what they're doing. They say that's not consistent with our faith. And so he sends a couple of runners out to stop Lee. And unfortunately, they don't get there until after the first attacks occurred. People died in the first attack. And so ultimately, the decision is if we let them go on to California while an army is approaching us from the east, they'll raise an army from the west and we'll be pinched in the middle. And it's either our families or their families. And they make the horrible and in many ways, irrational decision to murder everyone. Now, I say irrational because they, they should have thought that if these companies don't show up in California, someone just might ask, they might ask are questions they? then, too. Yes. <laughs> what happened? Yes. 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 Which is what exactly, exactly what happened. Uh, Ultimately, people in California figured it out quite quickly that Mormons and uh, Native Americans were involved in this. So what, what was the involvement, if any, of the Paiutes? So... Again, as, as Rick was explaining that from the start, the idea was to make it look like an Indian massacre and then lay the blame on them. And so the uh, Native Americans, the Paiutes were um, separated from the militiamen. The militiamen killed the men that they were walking with and the Paiutes were dispatched by Nephi Johnson to kill the women and children. That's why they're divided into mm -hmm. two separate groups. It's really one of the most heinous parts of the massacre. But I will say too, that the, the Paiutes were aided by white men who, Absolutely. after they had dispatched the, the men went up and helped to kill the women and children. We know that they had men on horseback to round them up like, <laughs> like stock and, and massacre them. In the end, Nephi Johnson feeling real guilt for what he had done, what his part was confessed to a Latter-day Saint leader, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve late in his life, white men did most of the killing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and how many children survive? 17. 17. Um, were they killing women because they didn't want witnesses who could say? Yeah, that's exactly that, right. That's Again, the point, right? The whole point of the massacre was mm -hmm. a cover up of the fact that white men were involved in these uh, cattle raids that actually there were multiple cattle raids taking place in September 1857 throughout the territory. Mm -hmm. The last one takes place on October 3rd, 1857 in the desert uh, southwest of the mountain meadows. And so when they find out that uh, white men are involved in this, like Rick was saying, they make the horrible decision that they've got to wipe out all the, the witnesses and they spare the children because they're considered too young to tell tales. The younger the children. oldest, the yes. very youngest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Only those very youngest. How the old oldest was, was six. There six, were two right? six year olds, yeah. a few younger than six. And most of them were toddlers or babies age two and under. And not everyone under six survived because of the gunfire and other things yeah, were going some, on. So. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. know some babies um, and some younger children being killed as well. Mm -hmm. It's horrific. So start, and t start to tell us how was it covered up? How did they begin to cover up this? So we talked about that letter when it, so at first when the militiamen, the perpetrators returned to their settlements, they're bragging about what had happened. They re, they arrive on Sunday and they're bragging about what has happened. So John D. Lee and men in Washington, they're saying, oh, hooray for Israel. And, and who are they telling like their congregations in church? Um, and then when Young's letter arrives that day saying, let them go in peace. As soon as they hear word of that, they start covering up and saying, don't ever talk about what Lee said on Sunday or we will cut off your tail just below the ears is uh, the expression that they use. So they start threatening local people and, and this is covered thoroughly in the book, but they start threatening local people about the truth that if they share anything about the truth that of what has happened, that they will be killed. And so this cover up starts immediately, not again, not only to outsiders, but again, also to top church leaders in Salt Lake city as well. Investigations are called for 
Tell us about the investigations that take place and what resulted from them, Rick. Uh, well, obviously, it got news got out. Yeah, news yes. got out. News, Papers news got in out. California Absolutely. and, and yeah. others. Yes. And it mm-hmm. was mostly from California. Is that or, or so, people expected this yeah. train? These so train. so what happens is there's a there's a wagon train call that we, we we call the Turner Dukes Company. It's a combined group of immigrants, and they are passing through just directly behind, uh, and they are attacked three times going through uh, Utah territory but and they're the ones that are raided on october 3rd they're the last to be raided so by the time they reach california they start saying hey this is mormons and indians using their parlance um, that have done this and so the newspaper newspapers in california start spreading the word that this has happened and that it's been the mormons and indians yeah, that at have first done it's this. sort of like we suspect it's alleged and then yeah. it gets grows stronger and, and then stronger like, more is, evidence yeah so compiles. these newspapers yeah. figure it out immediately then um, federal investigators in 1859 start investigating it and this is one of the tragic parts of the story is a man named jacob Ham- or jacob forney who's the uh federally appointed indian superintendent for Utah. He basically figures it all out in 59. He gets a list of names. He gives that to a federally appointed judge named John Cradlebaugh. And basically what they determine is what we have figured out from our research as well. It's the same story in as early as 59. But Rick can talk about the legal wranglings that take place that mean that it's not brought to trial after 59. <laughs> Brigham Young, at the time of the massacre, is confronting the the potential of the federal government entering his territory. And so when he gets the report from Lee, he's very disturbed that innocent blood's been shed on territorial soil. He's sickened by it. But he's also facing the reality that the federal government has sent this army and it's about to march into a city. It's He's the Johnston in, army that yes. people hear about. We yes. call it the Utah mm-hmm. expedition today, but you know, this expedition is about to enter. There's been some strong rhetoric on part of not all, but a few of the soldiers that's been heard by immigrants crossing the plains. And so they're worried that they're going to do what they bragged they were going to do, which is to hang all of the leaders on poles through the city and then have their way with the Latter-day Saint women and just basically wreak havoc. So Brigham Young's worried about that. When peace arrives in 1858, in the middle of 1858, Brigham Young gets a report from Jacob Hamlin. And of course, what he heard from Lee and what he hears from Hamlin are not the same. But he has to decide, what do I do with this? He sends a couple of members of the 12 out down there to investigate. They do some investigation, as we describe in our book. But by 1859, Brigham Young is unsettled about what he's heard. And the federal government has arrived in the form of judges and prosecutors. And so there's an initial trial in, in March in, not a trial, but an initial court in Provo in, in March of 1859. It does not go well. But after that, Brigham Young says, I want this prosecuted. So he goes to the federal district attorney and he says to him, do this your way. You know, we don't, we're not going to prosecute in our courts. You do it your way in your courts with your people. All I ask is that you do it in a place where witnesses don't have to travel very long to get there because that'll increase the likelihood you'll get witnesses. And I will assure that whoever the suspects are, are in court to be tried. Unfortunately, one of the judges was thinking about running General Albert Sidney Johnston as a candidate for president of the United States. He wanted the quote unquote Mormon problem to be the basis for that campaign. So he didn't want to resolve the issue The federal officers are at an impasse because some like Jacob Forney want to move forward. Others like uh, Eccles do not want to move forward. And so it deadlocks. So thereafter, repeatedly, Brigham Young comes forward with that offer and says, I want it tried. I want it tried. It's not until the second John D. Lee trial that the prosecutor accepts his offer. Hmm. So I was going to ask you about the two trials or we were going to, but I, I think we've covered that now. So Lee is convicted. Why was he executed at the massacre site? That's when was unusual. that, by the way? That was a long time after 19, 1859. 1877, what is it? Well, the execution occurred March 23, 1877. Yeah. So not quite 20 years after the massacre itself. The reason he was taken to the massacre site was that the, the local law enforcement people and the federal prosecutor hoped to get more out of Lee than they had gotten by his meager confession. He had, Lee had been given an opportunity before the first trial of writing a confession and turning state's evidence. They really wanted to go after William Dame. He was the main leader in Southern Utah militarily. He was a state president in Parowan. 
And so because he was the chief military leader and the one who gives the ultimate permission for the massacre to occur, they thought he'd be the best person to go after. Lee makes a he's Lee is offered a plea deal. He's told, look, if you just agree to write a confession, we'll drop one of two counts against you. If the confession is satisfactory, we'll drop the second one and you walk. So Lee talked to his attorneys. They said, look, this is the best deal you're going to get. So Lee agreed to write the confession and he sat down to do that. They dropped count one, but he wrote a very meager confession. It didn't give them anything they need needed to prosecute Dame. So at that point, they decided, well, we've got the goods on Lee. We're going to go after him instead. So that's how he ends up on the point of the spear. And then the, the, the first trial is very interesting, as we explain in our book, because no one has ever really understood what happened before. But we were able to find documents that had not been previously transcribed from shorthand or from Deseret Alphabet. And when we pulled it all together, what we realized is that the first trial was entirely a show trial and that neither the prosecution nor the defense wanted it to end in a conviction. So they were using it simply as a way of trying to get what they wanted. On the part of the prosecution, they had tried to get federal legislation to disenfranchise the Latter-day Saints so that they could then become the economic and political leaders of Utah. Congress looked at their proposed bill and thought, no, it's not very American to take away these rights that these people have had. So we'll give you a watered down bill and we'll give you more if you need it. So they went back to Utah and thought, we need more. We're going to use this first trial as proof that the Latter-day Saints can't convict their own. Therefore, they shouldn't self-govern. And so they deliberately throw the first trial. Mm. So back up for a second. So you had, before you had said Dame had originally said, leave these guys alone, but then he ultimately is the guy that gives the signal. What about hate? What happens? Yes. So yes. What, yes. what was so, his involvement? So what happens is Isaac Haight, uh, the, he state makes president. the state president's mm-hmm. Cedar City, he makes a decision. He takes uh, one of his counselors with him in the state presidency. Um, he makes a decision to go talk to Dame to get permission to call out the full militia in order to make this very bad decision of wiping out all of the witnesses. And so he goes and there's a council meeting in which uh, William Dame calls his high council together and they again say, let them go. But then hate pulls him aside alone afterwards, William Dame. And he says, you don't have the full story here. We've already killed some of the people in there. And then he also said, and they know, and they know that we're involved. Mm-hmm. And he says, there's not that many people left inside and hate has never been out there. He gets a message from Lee saying, I think most of them are all killed. So hate has no idea how many women and children are there as well. So he says, they've mostly all been killed. We just need to finish off the job. This is called uh, the, ta- the Tan Bark Council by the local people at the time. And that's what we call it in our book as well. Mm-hmm. So he gets this go ahead, this nod from Dame to call out the militia. This is on Thursday, September 10th. And Dame or hate goes back calls out the militia, sends them to the mountain meadows, and they commit the massacre within hours after their that's why That's why those were the two ringleaders, exactly. Dame and Hate. Yeah, Dame was the highest ranking man militarily, and so he gave that And what you just word. said, Barbara, about um, they thought there weren't that many people left. About how many victims do does your research now say? You- so... So what um, we found, and and this is based on um, descendants groups information and and all of the research we did in book one, we have an appendix of the, all of the immigrants who've been able to be identified so far. We counted those up and it only comes to 88. And so for a time, there's been great anxiety about, okay, who are the missing 30 people? Because the number that Jacob Hamlin estimated to the army in 1859 was 120 when he buried their remains. Um, so that's the number that we've had so far was 88. And everybody's been saying, we've got to find those remaining 30. How do we find those remaining 30? But what was interesting is when we started working on the aftermath of the massacre in this book, we found two very early sources that occur that are um, shared just the day after the massacre. One of the militiamen, uh, in fact, it's William Dame, who's been there for the burial. Mm-hmm. He tells a, a passing group of um, we'll just call them immigrants, um, the day after that he has counted up 95 
victims. And then John D. Lee, when he's telling about the massacre in his congregation on September 13th, says 96 victims. So that was really interesting that that came Mm -hmm. out. Those numbers are very similar. And they're also very similar to the number of 88 that modern uh, historians have been able to come up with. So based on all of that, we believe it's probably closer to those numbers. Now, why does that matter? We don't want to establish that number to say, oh, well, the massacre was a little bit less horrible than it was. It doesn't matter. It was horrific no matter how many Mm -hmm. people were. Even if one person was murdered, it's horrific. So it's not to try and make the the massacre look uh, less heinous than it was. It's so that descendants of victims and others can now rest assured we probably have pretty much the names of everyone who lost their lives there. And also it can um, put to bed rumors that there was another group called the Missouri Wildcats (laughs) that were, that must've been traveling with them and there's no evidence to support Mm. that. So it, it allows us to debunk those rumors. And what's really interesting is Juanita Brooks in her 1970 edition of mass of mountain meadows massacre says she's convinced that the number of 120 victims is too high mm. as well. So, mm. Now, in addition to the 95 or 96, we do know of three who tried to escape to California who were killed. We know of some who left and tried to go to the settlements who were killed. So we don't have an exact number. Your, mm-hmm. your statement yeah. in the be- beginning that you know roughly 100 mm-hmm. is somewhere in the ballpark. Mm-hmm. So going back to the execution, if I remember correctly, you, you write that People at newspapers and others were just waiting to see if Brigham Young would be implicated right to the final days, right? John D. Lee never does, but what was his relationship with Brigham Young at the end, Rick? So let me explain that Lee's relationship with Brigham Young has been misunderstood. Many people have pointed out that under what was called the law of adoption at the time, John D. Lee was a quote adopted son of Joseph Smith. But there were dozens Brigham of Young. Oh, excuse Brigham me, Young. Of Brigham Young. But there were dozens of people at the time who were adopted in that way to church leaders. It didn't mean that they had a really close relationship by the time. But but John D. Lee was very deferential to Brigham Young, and I think for much of his life intended to express uh, feelings of of a son towards a father. But by the end of his life, John D. Lee hated Brigham Young and he hated him because he thought that somehow or another he'd be protected in all of this. And Brigham Young, who was disturbed by it all, didn't, he wanted justice to be done. Now you might ask, why didn't John D. Lee just falsely implicate Brigham Young? Because he sure lied about a lot of other things. He said he didn't do it at the beginning. And then he, even at the end, he said, well, I didn't do anything designedly wrong. He refused to accept full responsibility for what he had done by himself. And the answer is a very interesting one of Latter-day Saint theology. In the Doctrine and Covenants, a a book of Latter-day Saint scripture, there's a statement that if you shed innocent blood, you can't go to the highest degree of the celestial kingdom. Joe, or, John D. Lee knew Brigham Young did not order the massacre. And if he stated that he did and Brigham Young were executed as a consequence of that, then Lee feared that he would lose his highest degree of the celestial kingdom status. So despite the pressure he had and despite the opportunity he had to go free, if he were willing to implicate Young, he didn't do it on that point of Latter-day Saint So theology. he thought he would be in the highest he, d- degree of the celestial kingdom, even having participated. <laughs> yes. Oddly. And died for his sins, being uh, wow. executed for wow. his sins. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. he was thinking of afterlife. He yeah. was. He, was doing absolutely, that, which is, he absolutely well, to be believed clear, in he, the afterlife. He wasn't Dame or, or hate. What was his role? He was the one that held up the flag. Is that? Yeah. So he had a, a, a leading role at the massacre and he certainly um, was guilty of the things he was convicted for. He did murder people and we, there were witnesses that saw him physically murder some of the immigrants. Mm. He was there with that initial uh, cattle raid that went awry on September 7th. He was leading um, Paiute people from near his, at an Ash Creek band near Harmony. And, uh, and then he was, Part of he carried out the plan full on and was a leader. He was the one who went into the emigrants corral carrying a white flag, which was a symbol of we're here to protect you, went and negotiated with the the emigrants and convinced, convinced them to give up their guns and come out of the wagon corral under a promise, a false promise of Hmm. protection. So he was absolutely guilty. Um, for what he did, there were just many, many others that were also guilty. And nothing ever happened to any of the other perpetrators. 
So there are nine people who were indicted by a federal grand jury in September of 1874. As we mentioned before, they wanted to go after Dame. He was the leader, the highest military leader to approve it. They end up arresting five out of the nine and they work to try to get the evidence they need on all of them. But the evidence is just better on John D. Lee. So they decide to make him the target. John D. Lee had the unfortunate characteristic that he loved to talk. He was a silver tongued kind of man. Mm. And, and loved he, to drink. And, <laughs> and you put the two of those together and he just, <laughs> while others said not a word, he became the poster child because he was willing to talk about it a lot. And he, and he changed his story over time. So he became the, the national and even international poster boy for the massacre. And so that was one reason they went after him. Huh. And we should point out there were nine men indicted for the crime in the 1870s. And John D. Lee was caught. Um, William Dame also turned himself in. He was one of the nine indicted, but he, there was just not enough hard evidence to convict Dame because of this secret Tam Bark council when mm -hmm. he just gave a verbal, okay, go ahead and do this. Um, so Lee was caught and the others lived on the lamb. Isaac Haight hid his they go whole into life. Hiding and they, he yeah, goes into they, hiding his entire life, lives right. down in Mexico for a time. And it's, it's really tragic throughout the book. We show there's like these near slips where federal investigators, uh, marshals almost catch Higby and Hayde and other perpetrators, and they just slip through their fingers again mm. and again. And it's just agonizing to watch that happen. Mm. So none of the other eight indicted are exonerated. They're all charged. And after the Lee trials, they continue to make efforts to try to find them. Brigham Young had earlier said, you know, if you'll, if you'll get my help, I will help you bring them in. He brings in the witnesses for the Lee trial. And then what breaks down is that the real reason that the Liberal Party members are doing this is because of their political desire to gain economic and political control of Utah. George A. Smith, who is one of the leaders at the time that they think must have some type of role in this, he passes away. Brigham Young passes away within a short time in August of 77. And so the political power of the massacre dies off at that point for them. Mm. So they go after plural marriage in a big way because... Because the successor to Brigham Young is John Taylor, and he's a very you know adamant polygamist. The Edmunds Tucker Act. Comes yes. And, yeah. Yeah. So they basically the, the Mountain Meadows. Sadly, Mountain Meadows is pros the massacre is prosecuted only because it has political rationales behind it, and when that rationale is lost, they then go after plural marriage and succeed in their desire to disenfranchise and gain political and economic control, which continues until statehood essentially. I think we also need to, uh, to point out that there was a lack of funding from the federal government for federal marshals to track down. I mean, if you think about it, hunting down and tracking, um, perpetrators, especially at the time when you're on horseback, mm -hmm. um, cost a lot of money. And by then, uh, the federal government had lost interest in funding this. So the, the, uh, prosecuting attorney, Sumner Howard, who who won Lee's conviction, he's going after people afterwards. There's a, there's a misperception. This is another myth. I think we debunk, we debunk that Lee's execution ended it all and nobody cared anymore, but they still, they're still trying to get more people. And, and Sumner Howard hopes for that. But then when the funding fizzles out, it just kind of dies out eventually, but he is still trying. And I, I will tell you, I found a newspaper article just this past week from a March 1877 uh, account in the Midwest, what we now call the Midwestern United States, in which the reporter is saying, everybody here in Utah says, get all of those perpetrators and prosecute them all. Wow. wow. I wow. wish we'd had that before. <laughs> that <too>. so, <laughs> <was> published. <laughs> so, I, I think I know how you'll answer this, but I would like to know, after examining all this, what would true justice have been for the Mount Meadows massacre, Rick? Brigham Young said when he found out about it, he says, I'm not going to go after what he called the young men. Now, keep in mind that people have exaggerated the youth of some of the participants. They were largely adults mm -hmm. and they would have been responsible under under law to be prosecuted, every single one of them. But Brigham Young says, I, I'm not going to go after the, the those, but I'm going to go after the leaders. And interestingly, Judge Jacob Borman said exactly the same thing. He says, we want we want to go after the leaders. So he was encouraging, Judge Borman was encouraging people who participated in the massacre, but were not leaders to come forward and help to convict the leaders. Hmm. Barbara, what about you? I agree. Um, <laughs> I would have liked to have seen everyone who participated tried and, and convicted. I'm, I'm against the death penalty, mm -hmm. but I would have liked to have seen them. Um, what would the that list. number be about? Um, 
the the research shows that there were between 50 and 60 militiamen that were involved. Of varying degrees. Of varying, some of them. Of varying degrees. Yeah. yeah. So I would have liked to have, I personally, that's what I would have liked to have seen. Mm. That would have been meant justice. And then the surviving children, um, they were returned to their families in 1859. But if there could have been a, a returning to them of, of the wealth that their families at least had so that they could have had an easier life. They, they, they lived hard, difficult lives afterwards and were never compensated their families for, for what was lost. So I would have Mm -hmm. liked to have seen um, their lives made better Mm -hmm. afterwards. Mm -hmm. So, but truly there, there is no justice. There's no way to bring back uh, what happened to change that. So what, um, what surprised you in your research that you, weren't expecting so much other than the (laughs) the number of victims possibly. But other than that, like what kinds of things uh, were you expecting that didn't, didn't turn out to be true. And so we, we started this project with the idea we were just going to dig deeper than anybody ever dug before, not let any stone go unturned. The research for this book and the, and the prior one required actually getting materials from 31 of the 50 U S states and three national archives facilities, one in Washington, DC, one in Maryland and one in Denver. By the time we finished, we had over 50 linear feet of files. And so we were willing to just learn the story, whatever it was to me, one of the greatest surprises was how this whole thing was investigated and prosecuted. I was one who sort of followed the earlier view of Juanita Brooks and others that, you know, this was a, this was something that was reluctantly uh, prosecuted by Latter-day Saint leaders and that in, in the end, they helped to sort of make John Dealey a scapegoat. And what we discovered was that's not true. Lee ended up on the point of the spear because he refused to, <laughs> to do for federal people what they wanted him to do to convict Dame, which was who they really wanted. Um, I think that the relationship between Brigham Young and the federal government, between Latter-day Saint leaders and the federal government, waxed and waned over time in part because they were going after polygamists and all of the Latter-day Saint major leaders were polygamists. So there were times when they were resistant and other times when they were cooperative and it kind of goes on and off throughout. But it's clear at the end that Brigham Young from 1859 on wanted this thing cleared up because he felt like it was sitting on his shoulders until it was cleaned up. Mm. So, I mean, would you say Brigham Young helped cover it up? I would say that early on, if you, again, if you look at the, at the book itself, what you'll see is that initially when he writes to Washington about it, he's very much following this idea that the, that the murders were caused by bad immigrants doing bad things to Indians, which in turn caused those Indians to then massacre immigrants. And I think Brigham Young knew that in fact, that was not true. That the, that this was done probably as a result of the, you know, he had this policy of having whites and Indians raid cattle companies as part of that same policy that he had to send Lot Smith up and raid the, the army supply trains. It was all intended to be nonviolent. Nobody was supposed to get hurt. But somehow or another, things went awry in southern Utah. I think Lee led him to believe that it was Paiutes who went awry without white help. Um, but I think Brigham felt some degree of guilt that this may have been a result of his, his wartime policy. He didn't intend for anybody to get hurt, but it was one of those unintended consequences. So I think initially he was hesitant to, to talk about that, but over time, I think he begins to realize we've got to take care of this or the shadow of it will never be off our territory. (laughs) He sent in talking with John Bernheisel, the, the territorial representative of Washington, trying to get statehood for Utah, Bernheisel basically said, whoever it was that carried out this massacre is going to have to pay for this in eternity because they're keeping us from statehood and from other advantages that we would enjoy as a federal territory because they did this. Hmm. What about you, Barbara? Surprises? So, so many surprises. And, and uh, Rick and I hope that our readers will also be surprised and have a lot of new learnings. And a f- the few people I've talked to who have already finished the book have said, wow, I've, there is so much I've learned and they, they want to talk more about it. But for me, something studying what happened after the massacre almost gave me more of an 
understanding of the massacre itself than what was happening before the massacre. And let me explain why. We talked about that Turner Dukes train that was raided on October 30th by some of the same men who had participated, some of the same Indian missionaries who had participated in the Mountain Meadows massacre. And so I thought, why did that raid take place after Mountain Meadows? And then we started looking and we found uh uh, attacks, uh, assaults on um, emigrant cattle com- companies in northern Utah. Mm-hmm. And there, if you look at the back of the book, for those that have it, and the end paper in the back, it shows where all these attacks occurred throughout uh, Utah territory from September 7th through October 3rd, multiple cattle raids. And so that really confused me. And I thought, well, if this wagon trade was singled out, then why were all these other trains also being rated. Mm-hmm. And so looking deeper at that and then finding this this policy that Rick was talking about in time of war, he wanted to bring young wanted to convince the federal government that if you pulled young and the Mormons out of power, then the Indians quote will do what they please. And uh, he wanted to convince the federal government it was because of the Mormons influence that the Indians weren't rad- raiding cattle. Mm-hmm. And he's blustering and saying as much in his public speeches, but then privately uh, he's telling some of his Indian interpreters to encourage Indians to join with whites in raiding cattle. So that uh, kind of shares a a new motive, another, an additional motive behind the Mm -hmm. massacre that was very surprising. Uh, Go ahead, Rick. Another surprise I had, Juanita Brooks in her book talks about how Lee was executed and everybody else just lived honorable lives and without fear. We found out that, in fact, that's not true. The last two chapters of our book that deal with what happened to those people, I think, was a big surprise to me to see that they didn't live peaceful, happy lives thereafter. They were on the lam. They they ran the gamut from John D. Lee, who on the night of the massacre was able to lie down and sleep like a baby and somehow rationalized all this in his brain to those who were consumed by this to the point of having an early demise as a consequence of it. And in between, I think people felt a considerable measure of guilt and they were constantly in fear of being arrested. So they, they fled from place to place and from, from pillar to post. And interestingly at the, in 1859, Brigham Young is talking to the army captain who erected the stone cairn and the cross over the the victims. And he's talking to them about it. And the the captain, Captain Price says to him, um, he talks about it and Brigham Young says, I want, I want the thing prosecuted. And Price said, well, uh, I, I've never heard it charged to you because Brigham Young says, I want it prosecuted because it's always being laid on my shoulders. And Price says, well, I've never heard it been laid at at your doorstep, but I think it belongs to John D. Lee. And finally, Price says, well, even if they escape vengeance in this life, they're going to have to face judgment in the next life. And Brigham Young says, yes, that's true. What what we show is beginning around 1862 with the great floods that that hit the Western United States at that time, the participants in the massacre begin to lose their spoils from the massacre. They begin then to live lives of poverty and being on, on the lamb. Uh, and so the, the title vengeance is mine, which is a quotation from the book of Romans in the new Testament in which the Lord says, vengeance is mine and I will repay. In other words, don't you take that into your hands. What we tend to see towards the second half of the book is that even though these people may not have been executed the way Lee was, they do get some punishment in this life. And then of course they have to face by their theology, the consequences in the next. As, as we begin to wrap up uh, and, and that leads to a question I have, uh, and I'll use a faith term. Were any of the perpetrators repentant? Yes. Absolutely. Explain, Barbara. Well, Rick was talking about how many of them felt horrible about it for the rest of their lives. Some didn't, um, but others did. Um, there's an account. He's He appears in book one, but a man named Joseph Clues, and he was just a horseman. He wasn't even at the massacre, but he was carrying messages between hate and Lee back and forth at the meadows. And he's so distraught, even though he didn't directly participate that he leaves Mormonism. He leaves Utah. He moves to California and he writes an, a newspaper article just saying, I spent the rest of my life being haunted by my minor <laughs> participation mm-hmm. in this. Our book closes with Nephi Johnson, whom we've talked quite a bit about today in this podcast. He was the, um, 
the young man, he was 22 or 23 at the time of the massacre, whom Haight called and sent out to the Mountain Meadows because he was fluent in Paiute. He was a missionary in the Southern Indian Mission. He sends him out and Lee is the one who is an interpreter, or excuse me, Nephi Johnson is interpreting what Lee is telling him to say to the uh, group of Indians that are there that their role will be. Nephi Johnson is haunted by that the rest of his life, so much so that at, towards the end of the, his life, he goes to a young school t- teacher, a mm-hmm. uh, 19 year old girl, <laughs> and says, I want to tell you my story. And she's really busy. She's engaged. She says, Oh, sure, I'll come out to the ranch sometime and get your story. She forgets about it until she receives a messenger saying, Father, Father Johnson is really sick. You've got to come see him. He's on his deathbed and he's calling for the little school teacher. So she rushes out there and uh, Nephi Johnson, when she arrives, he says, oh, good, good. She's here. But he's, he's kind of delirious. This is in 1919. And she waits for him to wake up so he can tell her whatever it was he wanted to tell her. She has no idea what it was. And at one point he's he's preaching and he's speaking Paiute. He's just delirious and rambling. And at one point he opened his eyes wide to the ceiling and said, blood, blood, blood. He screamed it. And this little school teacher is just terrified about what's happening. She says to a local ranch hand, what is wrong with brother Johnson? He acts like he is haunted. And one of the ranch hands says, well, maybe he is. He was at the mountain meadows massacre, you know, she did not know that young school teacher was Juanita Lovett, later Brooks, Anita who Brooks. goes on to yes. investigate and write the first scholarly book on and the Mountain Meadows Massacre. And that's how your book closes. And that's where that. we close. He is was with, at Mountain Meadows. Yeah, that's right. I, I was talking before um, about how reading this is because of how horrific it is. It's, as I called it, soul sucking. It is. Um, I'd like to know personally, maybe as the last question, how did you... How has it affected you? Rick, do you want to start? And Barbara? It has haunted me. It has given me nightmares. It's caused me, even in the middle of the day, to zone out, find myself mentally at the mountain meadows, waving my arms, screaming and yelling, stop, before it ever gets started. Where I have found comfort, and I believe Barbara's the same, is that we have befriended many of the descendants of the victims of the massacre. And we have tried with them to get whatever late justice we can get for these people. So with the full support and funding of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we proposed and gained National Historic Landmark status. We went to Washington to speak to the committee with them. They asked me to represent them as a, as a group. I gave a speech reflecting the feelings of the victims. And it brought tears to my eyes. And afterwards, as we were hugging and taking photographs and so forth, I felt what we have often said, and that is, no one today is responsible for the massacre, but we're all responsible for how we deal with it. If we deal with it honestly and straightforwardly, and honor the dead whose lives were taken from them wrongfully and seek to preserve the place of their burial, which is still there, the mountain meadows, then we can do something for those people. Barbara. So like Rick, um, working on book one, I was the content editor of Massacre in Mountain Meadows. And the chapter that I worked most thoroughly on was the massacre chapter. And, um, I put in every detail I could find about the horror and horrific nature of the massacre. And the reason I wanted to make sure that was all included was I never wanted to hear anyone ever say again, well, those people deserve that. And I wanted to tell the truth about what happened to them. But working on that, that chapter uh, had its effect on me like it did on Rick. Um, I would often be sobbing at work. I was so grateful I had an office with a door I could close At the time I was working on, I had my own two little little girls. And so I recognized I was the same age as many of these immigrant women and had children the same age that they had. And I just uh, would think of them and what they went through. Um, I was privileged to meet um, 
the direct descendant of Alexander Fancher and Eliza Fancher and um, John Twitty Baker when they came to Salt Lake City once. And I just grabbed them and told them how sorry I was for what had happened to their people. They hugged me back. We started crying. They invited me out to Arkansas um, for the 150th um, reunion of all of the descendants of the immigrant train. They gathered at the, at Beller Spring, which is where the immigrant train left from. And they were all there, all these family members. And I was able to tell each one of them how sorry it was. And that's what healed me and finally helped me to feel better. And like Rick said, we just said, what do you want? What do you need? And they wanted the, the land protected. So we sought national historic landmark status for them. And then they always said, just make sure you always tell the story please tell the story, make sure people know about this. And so that's why this book is so important to us. And later, some of them, a couple of, of people who are Fanchers came out to visit us in Salt Lake city. And so we set up a, a luncheon between them and um, elder Henry B. Eyring, who had read an apology on September 7th, 18, or excuse me, 19, 2007 mm -hmm. at a commemoration. And at that luncheon, elder Eyring said, you know, he talked about how wonderful it was, the reconciliation that was going on. And he said, you know, we believe in, in an afterlife. And he said, I believe that there are people on the other side as well, that there's a reconciliation going on there as well. I was very touched by that statement. And then after Rick and I started working on Vengeance is Mine, I was doing some family history work and I discovered I was a direct descendant of a perpetrator. And, um, so just all of these experiences have been incredibly moving for me. And I've been very grateful to Rick for asking me to work on this project with him and be involved in this and bring the healing and reconciliation that we have. So it's, um, while it was horrific to go through it, I'm glad that we've gone through it and, uh, it's, it's brought so much healing and I feel like it's probably one of the greatest things I'll ever do in my lifetime. The name of the book again is Vengeance is Mine, The Mountain Meadows Massacre and Its Aftermath. Barbara Jones Brown, Richard E. Turley, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And thanks to Peggy Fletcher Stack. Always a pleasure. And to our producer, Christopher Samuels. We remind you that you can keep up on all the happenings in and about the church by subscribing to the Salt Lake Tribune's free Mormon land newsletter. Just go to sltrib.com to sign up and we'll talk again next time 